Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth and I am the project officer at the Network of European Museum Organizations. Today it is my pleasure to invite you back to our welcome session of NEMO's European Museums Conference, Museums Making Sense. Before we begin, I'm going to review a few technical bits that I'm sure you're all very familiar with at this point. Your cameras will always be off, but you will be able to see the speakers. If you have questions for the speakers, please place them directly in the chat, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. If you have technical or organizational questions, please write a message to office at nemo.org. If you can't hear us or if you're having connection issues, we recommend checking your audio uh, settings or closing Zoom and rejoining. So now I'd like to introduce you to our next intriguing webinar with Lisa Baxter of the Experience Business and Jan Vonick of the Württemberg State Museum. They will dive into their case study, examining the benefits of visitor experience design in every aspect of the museum visit with how to become relevant, successfully establishing visitor experience planning. So without further ado, I will hand it over to them to get started. So, hello everybody. Um, my name is Jan Warnecke from the State Museum Württemberg in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, I'm sharing with you um, the most awkward experience of my life. I have about 150 people looking at me in my office. Um, I'm pleased to go through this um, with Lisa Baxter, with whom I've been working throughout the last one and a half years. And we would love to share our experience. Just some brief words about the Württemberg State Museum. It's a museum for cultural history. We have about 1 million objects in our collections. And um, they date from prehistoric ages up to the 20th century. We do one larger exhibition per year, which means uh, an exhibition of about 1,000 square meters and about two to three other exhibitions in the other facilities we run. So, Lisa, it's your turn. Okay. Hi, I'm Lisa Baxter. Um, I'm founder of the Experience Business and an audience experience specialist. Um, I currently design and facilitate programs that place the audience experience at the heart of strategic objectives and working practice. And I work with arts and cultural organizations like these to ensure that what they offer is appealing, relevant, meaningful, engaging, and impactful. Not only does this go to the heart of mission, but it also makes good business practice. The way that I do this is by facilitating programs and labs that take people on an experiential learning adventure on the value and craft of audience experience design. And this is what we're going to be sharing with you today. Um, we're going to tell you the story of how my design method slowly infiltrated an initially skeptical museum, Jan, and how this is materially impacting on their thinking, practice and culture. Our intention is to shift your perspectives, awaken your visitor sensibility, and hopefully make you feel curious and motivated to try something new. So please do pop your questions in chat if there's anything you'd like to ask us at the end. So chapter one is called Taking a Leap of Faith. Two years ago, I was invited by the digital agency Flux Guide, based in Vienna, to introduce my practice to Landers Museum Wittenberg, who they were working with to develop a multimedia guide. They were at the very start of the project and hoped my, interven my intervention would result in a more detailed brief. For some time, Flux Guide had been frustrated in the number of museums that regarded digital as a bolt on, a shiny new toy that would magically reinvigorate the visitor experience, with no real thought into the holistic understanding of what that experience is or how digital might fit in. Not only did this result in bad digital briefs, but also in digital solutions that did not fulfill their potential. Stop smiling at me, Jan, you're making me giggle. In order to avoid the problems here, Flux Guy wanted me to support them in developing a more integrated view 
of digital development by grounding um, them in my work around visitor experience design. And yeah, I was a little skeptical to begin with. Yes, in fact, I was. Um, our museum, you probably read it in the beginning. I'm the head of the project steering, so I'm used to develop processes for the house. And as soon as we start with the project, we exactly know how to do it. And we have well-established processes in our museum. So I was thinking, what's that about? Why do I need a consultant for just explaining me how to do my work? I know that already. Um, so I'm generally skeptical against consultants and workshop methods, as I have an education as process facilitator as well. And I have been to too many irrelevant workshops in my life. Usually I sit there and think, oh, this should be done better. So I was asking myself, why get involved into something that I would already know how to do it successfully? Okay, so that's what I had to contend with uh, when I went into the museum for the first time. So um, when I work with museums in this way um, and embark on a visitor experience program, um, I always begin by pressing the museum's reset button, gently challenging dominant thinking and practice such as we're in the business of making exhibitions. Knowledge and learning is paramount. My department is responsible for this bit of visitor experience. And my favorite, we believe the visitor experience is very important. The even though museums say that, most of them don't know what visitor experience is, not in any meaningful way. And too many regard that experience as a byproduct of what they really do, which is to create exhibitions and learning programs. So let's take a moment now to reset. So I'm going to say that we are not just in the business of creating exhibitions for visitors. We're also in the business of conceiving, designing, and managing experiences for people. Museums in general tend to regard their exhibitions and programs of work as their core product. But what visitors are really buying into with their time, their attention, and their money is their experience of the exhibition. Yeah. And as significant as your collections and stories are, they're simply a means with which to achieve that experience. We might go so far as to say that the visitor experience, the learnings, the, ex the impacts uh, that are created are in fact your core value offer. This experiential value, if well designed, can bring value back into your museum in the forms of mission delivery, stronger brands, more and happier visitors, repeat visits, increase loyalty and spend. So what is visitor experience exactly? Well, I just want to share um, a few very simple frameworks that uh, when I share them with museums, they find them very helpful. So um, here's the first statement, which is that the visitor experience is the end-to-end -end interaction between a museum and a visitor. In other words, it's a journey that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Beginnings might be their first click on your website or crossing the threshold into your museum. Endings might be when they exit your building or when they unsubscribe from your mailing list. Next, it is a blend of the organization's physical, curatorial, digital and human performance. The senses are stimulated, the emotions evoked, the learnings, meanings and impact that results. This is about the unique blending of your environmental, operational, human and curatorial processes and how your visitors interact with them and the degree to which those interactions deliver a great experience. This is what makes you matter. Finally, these experiences are intuitively measured against visitor expectations across all moments of contact. How you perform in relation to visitor expectations is a major factor in influencing their experience. You see, the expectations that your visitors come with are, in fact, mainly established by you through your branding, your digital presence, marketing and communications. The degree to which you meet those expectations will have a direct impact 
on what they think about you and the value they place on you. So let's just talk a moment, uh, for a moment, about visitor satisfaction. In my approach is never to measure the satisfaction levels of a visitor, right? Well, if I were to ask you what the most satisfactory experience you've ever had was, would you be able to tell me? It's because satisfaction is what makes you forgettable. You've given your uh, visitors what they've expected um, and, and oh, I got what I wanted. And yet, this is how most of you measure performance. My view is that we need to be aiming, in fact, for visitor delight by being surprising, memorable and powerfully meaningful and always in a way that exceeds your visitors' expectations. So let's move on now to the process of experiencing. And what I want to share with you next is a lovely model that um, really demonstrates in a very simple way at different levels um, or layerings of experiences. Um, all experience begins with the senses, which once awakened lead to a corresponding emotion. Both of these happen in a split second um, in your bodies um, and they are pre-thought. And they set the stage for what happens next, which is when we realize that we're having an experience. Here is where we move from the unconscious to the conscious realm, where we become aware of our experiences, alert to our thoughts and feelings about that experience, such as learning something new and interesting, feeling a strong sense of identification with a particular exhibit or a story, or rejoicing in the bonding and physical displays of affection that a family day out at a museum brings. A meaningful experience is when something personally significant occurs and we are struck by what that experience means to us. It feels like a depth chart and resonates somewhere deep inside. These meaningful experiences and their impacts can shape and reinforce who we are. Or put another way, we are the sum of all our meaningful experiences and what we make of them. Finally, there is a turning point. This is when the experience elicits a shift in your visitors' perspectives, in their understanding, and perhaps even their belief systems. A shift which causes them to think and act differently as a result of the museum visit. They might make different choices about their lives or maybe even become an activist. This is what we refer to as a transformative impact of arts and culture. In the work that I do, I aim to integrate as many of these layers as we can into visitor experience through careful empathy design and planning. In order to help this process, I've overlaid these different types of experience onto Maslow's hierarchy of needs like this. To create a ladder, that supports me and museum teams uh, in design, designing for higher and deeper levels of experience, engagement, meaning making and impact. First, the visitor's safety and physical needs need to be met in order to ensure that they're at ease and importantly, fully receptive to the intended museum experience. Fail here and they'll go into survival mode. I won't be receptive. Um, to, the, to anything that you want to show them. And they'll be feeling all the associated negative feelings and emotions of frustration, discomfort, and disorientation. Then we focus on the human to human interactions, which as we know, is a vital element of the visitor experience. Next is the intrinsic experience. This is about the moment by moment interactions between your museum and your visitors and all the thoughts, feelings and emotions that occur during that time. Enrichment, fulfillment and shift are the higher order experiences. This is where visitor empathy and an understanding of their need states really come into their own in the design process. In tipping the visitor experiences from intrinsically rewarding to meaningful, relevant and potentially transformative. For me, this goes to the heart of museum practice and my work in experience design. It's a craft that is very visitor-centered, that requires empathy, 
and creativity, working across departments to ensure everyone is working collaboratively to deliver a seamless and excellent experience for the visitor, whatever that means for the visitors you are designing for. So those are just a few of the models and mindsets I share with museums when I'm resetting them and thinking in a different way about visitor experience. Um, uh, and this is what I shared with uh, Landers Museum Wittenberg and Jan before then running um, a visitor experience lab to introduce my processes to the team. Uh, these processes were uh, developing a visitor experience framework for the museum, creating profiles of their core visitor types, often referred to as personas, and customer journey mapping, the orientation and wayfinding experience of the museum. This involved the team being split into small groups, each walk in the museum in the shoes of one of uh, uh, the perspectives of the persona. Um, and the process surfaced uh, visitor pain points and blind spots that hadn't registered uh, as a problem with the team before. And because this was all done with the digital agency, with Flux Guide, it directly informed how the multimedia uh, device um, could address problems and add value, not just generic value, but value with specific visitor types in mind as part of the holistic visitor experience. So Jan, how did you feel about this? You're on mute, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, it's much better now. Um, honestly, I was very, very skeptical, even in the workshop itself. Um, I liked and understood the theoretical approach, but um, I think as most of us, time is my smallest resource. So a two days workshop um, about learning how visitors might perceive things was kind of a maximum threat to my feelings. Um, and anyways, we knew precisely what we wanted. We had a defined concept. We wanted, we knew who we wanted to reach. So um, what made the difference? What, what was changing my mind? Um, what was changing my mind was that I actually went through the experience of the workshop, which was not only, right, this is how I felt in the end. Thank you for that slide. Um, so, it was not going through these two days changed my perception of the museum and for the first time I walked through the museum that I've been working for almost 15 years and I experienced a museum that my everyday self had forgotten that it exists. The museum I experienced wasn't quite as good as my professional self thought it would be. I had to admit that I had made up excuses for all the deficits because I knew why they were there and the way they came into being. But that didn't make the deficits any better by the end. Simple things occurred in a clearness and urgency of which I knew they were problematic, but I had lost the perception of how influential they were to the visitors' needs. Example, we have an inner court, it's a beautiful Renaissance court of an old palace. And in there stands a huge horseman statue. And I know who he is and I know why he stands there. But there's no sign, nor explication, nor anything. It just stands there. And anyone entering this courtyard, this beautiful Renaissance courtyard, has immediately one question. Who is the horseman and why is he there? And no one gets an answer. And that is very disappointing. So I... I, I was really disappointed. That was, that was bad. So making this experience is more intense than reading or listening or having a webinar on it. So actually going through the experience itself is absolutely necessary. It is feeling the pain and the glory of the experience. So how far away are we from our visitors' needs? And I knew that it was now necessary to spend more efforts on the experience planning. I wanted to present this approach and attitude to our entire team and to adopt the methods for our exhibition planning process. What did you do then, Jan? <laughs> well, the next thing I did is um, I talked to my director and told her about the experience I just went through. 
and she shared or she accepted that 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 is a good idea to bring that uh, knowledge to the entire team so we were able to to make up a new workshop and we asked lisa whether she was uh, willing to come to us without flux guide um and she came over with this beautiful klm airplane i guess um at that time we had a couple of exhibitions in planning they all when were at a different level of the process but we knew that we had to do something because I think as many museums, we want to do something new. We wanted that our exhibitions get better, more appropriate for today's um, public. And so we presented Lisa's method to the entire team, which are about 25 people in, in the sciences, in the um, communication department and in my department. And then we tried to bring Lisa into the projects at the different states of development. The first project we went into was the fashion exhibition, which was due to open in October 2020. And it opened in October 2020 just for being closed a week afterwards, which is really a pity. The planning for the design had almost finished at that time, and the design was approved. So the team had the desire to do something really new because the, ex the, the exhibition is about the fashion between the 1950s and today. So we wanted to be really cutting edge, modern and, and serving the two days public and not being one more cultural historic museum as there are so many. Um, and we had the dull feeling that the design and our concept hadn't achieved that so far. So we ran a visitor experience workshop and especially the exhibition architects were, let's say, taken by surprise um, about our decision. Our goal was to see how far we could go in developing personalized experiences for visitors to the fashion exhibition in a way that would attract new visitors whilst keeping the loyal ones happy. By weaving together tailored experiences that delivered on the, the visitors' different needs and motivations. And we did it. Here's how. First, we assembled a team. These are other teams that I've worked with uh, to show that all my work involves interdisciplinary, collaborative and co-creational practice. Working with teams in a way that leverages their combined skills, experiences and qualities. Harnessing the different and valuable perspectives of the group. I was no exception, as at Lambert's Museum, I worked with a front of house team, volunteers, curators, educators, and people from the marketing and digital departments. And in order to ensure we were truly visitor centered, we also invited visitor representatives to take part in the visitor experience lab, as well as the exhibition designers. When I arrived, the exhibition themes and concepts were already very well developed. So we used the exhibition model and the displays to brief participants as fully as possible in a curatorial vision, the different galleries and themes in the exhibition, and early stage exhibition design. Then each team took responsibility for one visitor type and immersed themselves in the world of that visitor and their specific relationship to fashion. Having real people in the groups helped provide that reality check, which prevented them from relying on their own assumptions about the visitor or simply deferring to themselves and their own preferences. Each team created a visitor sketch tailored to inform the process of personalization. These were then further developed into more fleshed out profiles called personas. This is what one of them looked like. On the left, you have the pen portrait that distinguishes this persona from different types of visitor. On the right, you have their motivations and need states in relation to this exhibition. And a need state is a critically important concept when it comes to personalization, because context is everything. What Nils and Nina want from a fashion exhibition may be def very different to what they want from, for example, an exhibition by Monet. And the sites of relevance will almost certainly be uh, different also. So let's take a quick look at Nils and Nina, their affluent, self-conscious professionals and discerning fashion shoppers. I've seen them as loads of the beach to go. They want an experience that exudes style, quality and great design. where They can feel affirmed 
by seeing something of themselves in the exhibition and with opportunities for impressive digital engagement. The chances are that Nils and Nina are not habitual museum goers, so it's also important to surprise and delight them and anchor a positive memory around their exhibition experience in the hope that they will return. And then let's just have a quick peek at the other three uh, personas, just in, in brief. There was Waltraud and Wolfgang, loyal uh, museum visitors, conservative in taste, who appreciate the finer things in life and who may want an experience that is gently informative, softly sensual and nostalgic. Isa and Ansel are young students. Appearance is important and fashion is a means of self-expression. Perhaps more street than Nils and Nina, they want an experience that is visual, engaging and digitally interesting, perhaps with more links to popular culture and street culture, the kind of culture that they recognise. Andreas and Andrea are hardworking, low to middle income people, more into popular culture than museum visiting. What they look for is something that is light, fun, social, highly visual and with minimal reading. The characteristics of each persona were then mapped onto a grid to identify points of commonality and points of difference. These were then synthesised into a visitor experience blueprint that provided a roadmap for the exhibition design. Here we have an at a glance representation of the shared and unique need states of each visitor type. And with this, we could identify which kinds of ex experiences would support most of the personas and which were highly discreet, yet important. It was in fact a guide on how to personalize the experience. The next change was to visit a journey map of the exhibition from the perspective of the personas using the scale model provided by the designer. And this served with some really rich in insights. There was a classic example of where a curator had supplied a list of requirements for one area in the exhibition. And the designer had created a beautiful thing around it, but without really considering the nuances of the visitor experience. The idea was to evoke the glamour and buzz of a fashion show. And the plan was to build a runway with a video wall of catwalk shows at one end, complete with loud pumping music. And on the runway, there would be static mannequins wearing fashion garments and at foot level, a number of screens playing videos of fashion shows through the ages. Our visitor journey mapping exercise demonstrated how this simply would not work. For starters, it wasn't very glamorous. The noise bleed alone would disrupt the experience for the other visitors. Static mannequins on the runway killed any sense of energy and made the runway off limits to the visitors, reducing it to merely a prop rather than a potential site of engagement. There was no way of getting involved or feeling a part of it or being on the runway. And with a bank of historic video at foot level, there was just too much going on. It needed to be rethought. And with the help of the visitor experience blueprint, the designers managed to turn it around into one of the defining um, experiences of the exhibition. And I really wish I had the soundtrack to go with that, that goes along with this. Called Showtime, the area is now an invitation into a discreet, immersive, sensory experience with plenty of wow factor and no objects. The lyric catwalk creates an infinity effect. The lighting and music club-like and vividly atmospheric. Ahead, a video of dancers voguing, multiplied by the mirrors. At times it booms and helps viscerally, and you feel first, and it's actually like glamorous. This is an evocative, social, playful experience. And visitors like Niels and Nina have been seen posing, dancing, voguing, laughing, interacting with each other and taking pictures. It's a memorable and shareable moment. One that evokes the glamour and appeal of the catwalk in a way that surprises and delights. Because who would expect this in a museum? And perhaps in taking part, some of the visitors may have come to embody their fashion selves or alter egos in a different way and witness the fashion selves of others and maybe in a way that affirms their own identities coupled with a sense of fun. So back to the workshop um, and, um, and the visitor journey mapping. The next thing we had to do once we'd identified all the problems and the blind spots was to do something about it. So uh, the team's deep work at, uh, around the personas 
help them reconceptualize the key elements of the exhibition by repurposing existing design concepts and developing new ones in order to trigger experiences that met the persona needs. These concepts were then pitched, critiqued and improved as a group before the designers took them to next stage development. At the end, we took time to reflect on what had happened and it became clear that the impacts on the team as well as on the ideas were also significant. The Raiders had developed a clearer vision for the exhibition in the form of the visitor experience blueprints. This was a whole new way of working for them. They appreciated the value of bringing together their curatorial authority with a more highly developed visitor sensibility and came to understand how different people can want different experiences from the same subject matter. They identified specific motivational drivers that could inform the design of more relevant, meaningful experiences. And they discovered the need to find triggers into deeper, more rewarding levels of interaction and engagement that could result in turning points. They came to understand how a network of tailored touch point interactions could create a more personalized experience for the visitor. And as for the designers, their approach shifted significantly from an emphasis on the aesthetics of the exhibition um, to an astute focus on the visitor experience. So Jan, how did it go? Well, let me be honest. Um, we were having a hard time with the design team. Um, we had a hard time with the entire team because everybody had to rethink about his role and responsibility in the project. And the people from the museum probably took it easier because the, um, the impulse of change came from the museum, but the designers were taken by surprise. And we had to talk a lot with them to, make, to, to, to explain to them that this is not taking away their responsibility or criticizing their, their approaches or their way of working. By the end, we did find together as a team again, and I think we delivered a very, very good exhibition. The result is a surprisingly broad exhibition from the content point of view and a carefully composed mixture of media in the exhibition itself, of which we were afraid, honestly, until the opening day that it might be too much. So we, we have put a lot of new things in, especially for social media, but also for movies, films, um, and we thought it, it might be an overload. We, as a museum of cultural history, as conservative people as we are, wearing strange jackets like this one. Um, the intensity of visual design elements is extraordinarily strong for the habits and the understanding of a museum. And certainly for those of our visitors, which are now named Waltrot and Wolfgang, so for our typical um, public. But it is not for Aisha, nor for Andreas or Nina. And they're all actually visiting, or they were when we were open. The, amount of visitors not belonging to our core visitor group was overwhelming throughout this week when we had open. And it was even strange to have these people in our museum, you know? Um, it, it, we opened the door and in came people dressed up like coming, from, um, like coming from the catwalk, people who really care about fashion in their lives. And they were not people caring about museum in their lives so much. Um, I would like to share two experiences with you. Um, recently, I was talking to a colleague from the building authority. She was visiting with a family, two children and the parents. And she said, you know, none of us has a similar understanding of fashion, but we all went in there. And afterwards, we met for a cafe and we talked about it and we had completely different experiences. We did uh, see different things than she saw different things than her children did or than her husband did but th just because they weren't so important to them but every one of them found something and they as a group enjoyed thereby the visit another story i really like is at the press conference our curator mike van rijn said that she was feeling to be the advocate of all these persona groups now and that she wanted to make sure that even walter and um, wolfgang find their approaches in the exhibition. And that led to the headline in the newspapers, which was, Wall Trout Loves It Too. So that is amazing, I think, how far the reach of this work can be. 
Now, um, during the same time, when we did the work for the fashion exhibition, we had two other exhibitions on the run at different levels of planning. Especially one project was challenging. It is about women at Baroque courts and the surprising careers they made. The project had begun with very different ideas what it should be about. The former director imagined a different focus than the curating team. So the concept dared the balancing act between something like the royal glamour show and a seminar in gender studies, and it didn't go well together. So um, we saw the need for another workshop there. We had a team that comprised of three, three curators, the museum director, the new museum director, who has certainly different interests than the former director did. Um, we had representatives from marketing, events, education, conservation, and digital, two interns. And um, some of those never had taken part in one of the workshops before. And then COVID happened. So the plan was I was going to come over and run physical workshops in-house with the team. Um, and obviously I couldn't. So the challenge was how to convert my immersive, collaborative, experiential learning programs into a virtual format. And I came across uh, Mural, which was a lifesaver. Um, Mural is an online collaboration tool that allows dispersed teams to work together on a virtual whiteboard with virtual moving stickies. It's easy to learn and it actually is a facilitator's dream. This became the vehicle for the whole program, which was constructed as weekly online modules that took place over a period of two months. We haven't got time to go into the program in detail, but I'll just share you some of the highlights. So, normally, when curators develop an exhibition concept, it's very information rich with a focus on knowledge, learning and objects, obviously. After working my usual reset process on them, I took them through a series of exercises to help them layer up um, the, co the concept of visitor experience by imagining all the different kinds of experiences. And here are some of the mural, oh, here are some of the um, mural boards they created by layering up all the different kinds of experiences that might happen in relation to doing, thinking, feeling, what the defining peak experiences might be and what kind of impacts post visit they were hoping for. Yeah. Well, this time um, we're in the face of the project where we don't haven't yet found a designer. We haven't even looked for one. But this time it is the curatorial team who is struggling with their role being used to develop content, con content concepts on their own, they now were afraid of being restricted by the team. But after a while of common need to develop, the core or the frame for the exhibition was shared throughout the team. And again, through the experience of the process itself, the curators managed to develop and redefine their role, be becoming again, the advocates for the interests of our audience groups. Another thing we wanted to do was try and identify points of thematic relevance and resonance between the lives of historic women uh, in the exhibition and women today, which could be surfaced and woven into the exhibition as part of its experiential melody. We then explored the themes through the lens of head and heart so that we could understand the potential of these themes to engage the mind and elicit emotional engagement. The next stage was to cast our gaze outwards and begin to look at who the potential visitors might be. And the key question we asked ourselves was what kinds of people might be drawn to this exhibition? We then did this huge brainstorm on a mural canvas, which was eventually refined into uh, these three key groups. Put very simply, uh, the groups were people primarily interested in the history who want deep and detailed knowledge, probably enjoy historical books, dramas and documentaries, and perhaps have a specific interest in the history of Southwest Germany. Then another group we defined was those drawn to more feminist angle, maybe because of their life experiences, because they strongly identify as feminists, or maybe just because their parents are girls. 
They would be drawn to the themes and, and correspondences between then and now, and an opportunity to inform their personal politics. Finally, there are those who might be interested in the women's stories, but who would, be, uh, who would visit as part of a social day out with their friends, and who might want something light, interesting and relevant, who, not, who might be delighted at the end that they had a surprising and emotionally engaging experience. And then we further develop these uh, using data and the knowledge of the team uh, into more defined uh, personas, each giving us an insight into what each type, each type might want from a visit to this specific exhibition. And importantly, suggesting how we might exceed their expectations in order to delight them. In this way, we're always seeking to push experiential performance at every stage in the process. Our challenge was how to apply these personas to the task of an ex exhibition that didn't exist, except in the curator's heads, on paper, as a rough concept document, and an online store of possible objects. My response was to try and visualise the exhibition as much as possible by creating a series of virtual galleries on mural with the curator. This virtual representation was structured thematically, as in the exhibition concept documents, with images of the objects they had in mind in each gallery, together with approximations of what types of activities and multimedia was in each room. What you can see here is just one element of the whole thing. Then the curators gave the whole team a virtual guided tour of the exhibition in order to immerse them as fully as possible in their exhibition ideas. Our hope was that this would be enough to enable the team to adopt a persona and walk through the exhibition in their shoes. And it was. To do this, I replicated the virtual exhibition three times on a mural board, each with its own visitor journey map and persona. They're arranged in such a way that we could compare the experiences across the three personas, gallery by gallery. The team was divided into three groups, each taking one of the personas, and they imagined walking in the shoes of their persona through the exhibition, marking the experience on the journey maps. Now, of course, it's not the same as a real thing. I know that. Um, but the real thing didn't exist. But in fact, as an indicator, it worked very well. What emerged were three very different pictures of the visitor journey from three different perspectives. Each one conveyed the highs, the lows, and the everything in between. And it was as near as we could get to empathy at this very early stage in exhibition and development. We learned that whilst it offered a great experience for the history lovers, it didn't work so well for the others. There was a lot of work to do in developing a narrative structure and story arc to engage those visitors who would enjoy a more emotionally engaging narrative experience. We needed better ways to surface relevance by building experiential bridges between the lives of women then and now. So the exercise actually raised more questions than answers, but they were very good questions. For example, how do you make detailed, complex historical material accessible to different levels of attention and types of interest? How can we weave the different need states of our three core visitors across the entirety of the exhibition experience? And how do we turn up the dial on contemporary relevance and emotional engagement? It was time to work on some of the tough questions. I ran two workshops called Explorations, and in the first, we explored concepts and structures around narrative and emotional engagement. And then I gave the team a mural board, which contained all the deconstructed elements of the exhibition as movable elements. With this, the team could reconfigure, remove and add elements just to see what happened. This provided everyone with a safe space and permission to play and experiment with ideas to think differently, to explore possibility, to try the unimaginable and all in a risk-free environment. I think they found the experience quite liberating and the results were impressive. Take these alternative exhibition structures, for example. Um, each one of the ones that they created resulted in a profoundly different visitor experience through different ways of connecting the themes or telling the story 
or connecting past and present, or by giving the visitors the option of choosing which themed room to go into based on their own preferences and interests, rather than going through a prescribed linear journey. So what's all this led to? Well, you need to watch this space, as the workshop's only finished a couple of weeks ago, and all this information is hot off the press. But I would like to share some of the immediate uh, learning outcomes of the virtual programme. We learned that the curators didn't find it easy. They weren't used to relinquishing their unique status and the way they usually squirrel themselves away to work on an exhibition alone. They felt vulnerable about opening themselves up to scrutiny at very early stage development and perhaps a little apprehensive about working in such detail with non-curators. All this was new, but they did get a lot out of it by directly experiencing the value of working, of working as a cross-departmental team, they came to understand that there is no I in curator. And by how pooling their collective skills, experiences and perspectives, they were able to problem solve, generate, generate ideas and develop their emotional literacy together. As a team, they now have a common understanding of this exhibition which will support them further down the line when they begin to work on marketing, education and programming. They have become much more visitor-centred and experientially focused and now appreciate that the key to great exhibition planning is to understand who your potential visitors are and what makes them tick and then build bridges between their interests and need states and the exhibition in a way that is relevant to them. And finally, the team directly experienced the power of experimentation and play at early stage developments. So let me finish, um, let me finish my part of this webinar by suggesting uh, that if you're committed to developing a truly great exhibition, traditional curatorial processes alone may no longer be enough. And what is required is a clear understanding of what you want for your visitor articulated in a visitor experience blueprint and in ways that engages your empathy and uh, deepens your visitor sensibility. You need to operate from an open and experimental mindset, working creatively and collaboratively to craft experiences that both deliver on your curatorial aspirations whilst also offering tailored experiences for specific visitor types and in a way that delights them and exceeds their expectation. This isn't about edutainment, it's about boosting your potential to become appealing, relevant, emotionally engaging, impactful and memorable. All you need to do is to reset and try out some of the new tools and processes I've shared with you today. Yeah. Well, um, you may have noticed that when when you decide to to take up that kind of work you definitely take two decisions the one is you strive for quality and that might impact your time schedule i'm responsible in our museum for time schedules i have to give the promise that we deliver in time but i do have to give the promise as well to deliver the quality we needed and that why that's why we are um, indulging so deeply into this kind of work and you, you will have seen with the last example how it changed the understanding of everyone in the team about their role, what they're actually doing, why they're working here, what is success for them. So what I would like to emphasize is visitor experience planning is not about talking about experiences. It is about experiencing itself. And after a while, it is taking up an evolved attitude that is more attached to the needs of others than to the proud self-understanding of being a successful museum professional. That's, that was my point of view when I did the first workshop. You know, I knew what I was doing. I still know what I'm doing, but now I know I do it much better because I do reach the things for which I do work for. Our museum will apply this methodology in the coming exhibition projects. And we have adjusted our budgets to do this, and we will have to adjust our time schedules to work this way. It takes time, it changes the team. People have to think and reconsider and have to adopt these values. At the same time, we are aiming to learn these techniques 
and become independent. This is probably a hard information for Lisa, but we're enjoying working together, but we don't want to spend the rest of our lives together. So at a certain point, oh, oh, well, I know we would, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, at a certain point that house has, to, the museum has to learn to work that way. This is level one, learn it doing it yourself. Furthermore, we are planning to introduce this methodology not only to exhibition design, but to all the fields in contact with the public, um, which are especially the communication field, the education and the digital department. And as a third step, what we want to do to change our house to get relevant today is to train in a biannual workshop our volunteers. Each second year in November, we get new volunteers to our house. And one of the first things they will have to do is to go through one of those workshops to get the values, to get the attitude, to get the techniques to work in that way. Because with, with the fashion exhibition and with the changes which we were achieving on the Baroque Women exhibition, um, we as a museum see that we actually manage now to do what we wanted to do. We wanted to become more relevant for the public and now we have the, the means to do it. Well, next slide, please. Um, the experience design is an experience that people have to go through. That is what I mentioned already. And it will open the eyes and allow you to slip into the needs of other people. And that is probably the most important thing to accept that you will have to have elements in your exhibitions, in, in all your programs, that you personally, even as professional, would probably not think they are necessary or even good, but they are good for your visitors when you have found them in the right way. The process to adapt that methodology to a museum needs to be moderated by an experienced person. And I'm really thankful to Lisa that she that she was taking the hard time to work with me all that time, even preparing that workshop wasn't all funny for her. Um, then next thing you have to do is to bring the skills and mindsets into your organization. That takes time. We are now working with this methodology for about almost two years and we will go on. And I personally think that with, within two or three years time, it will have become something self-understanding. No one will ask it. Everyone will just do it. It's, it just, came down to our consciousness. Um, we have to bring it to all the departments. It's necessary. It's not useful if only, if only the exhibition works that way, but especially the communication, the digital outreach do have to do the same things. Um, one consequence that this way of working brings with it is that you pull down fences between the departments and the house. It was so hard for all of us in the workshops to accept that none of the roles is um, secured, is, is protected. The, the, the opinion of everybody is relevant to come to a good solution. Um, we bring in our interns to these projects. And um, I, I have to say that oftenly these young people do have amazingly good ideas. So we, we just take that. Um, so, and what probably one last thing to say, if you come to an exhibition that has been developed following these methods, it will not necessarily look different from any other exhibition that you've been to. Um, but in a person in, re in responsibility, you will get the feedback that nearly all people who were attracted to the theme will appreciate the exhibition. The reactions we had on the fashion during the first week, be it in the press or be it by the public visitors, were astoundingly well. And those were not the people who come here usually. So, and that is success and, and being relevant for audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much um, for your wonderful presentation. I'll start by giving you my little uh, digital round of applause. <laughs> Um, but yes, I, Jan, I, I would like to first say that I, I really think it's such an added value to have someone who's experienced, you know, uh, Lisa's methodology rather than only having 
uh, the creator walk us through the methodology. I think that really, you know, aids us in uh, the museum experience of implementing this. And Lisa, also early on, I think it was so key that you also brought in the sensory and emotional aspect of the experience and that it really is an end to end when you're talking about the museum visits. And I also, you know, I, I really love this quote from you that uh, satisfaction is what makes you forgettable. It's really challenging all of us to level up what we are offering. So that's wonderful. Um, I would like to invite, I, we already have quite some questions in the chat, um, but if there are more questions, uh, please feel free to continue submitting them. And if we don't get to all of them, then of course, I'm sure our speakers will be happy to address you afterwards. So um, I would like to start with, do uh, you feel that uh, art museums are less compatible with this sensory model? as they can uh, detract from an already existing highly aesthetic visual experience and possibly over uh, stimulate the visitors' interactions with the objects. Shall I answer, Jan? Yeah, go ahead. So, so if I were to run away, I've, I've run this workshop in my head mentally for years, is um, what if we broke all the rules? because there is a, a, a standardized way of experiencing art, which is very minimalistic and yes, very aesthetic, but there can be alternatives and you can have both. So what about if there were spaces in an exhibition where you had the painting of the week, where you were able to go in and, and re-experience it in a different way? So that what you're doing is you're not changing how museums function, you're just giving visitors the choice of being able to experience a, a, a work of art based on their own experiential preferences rather than those of the art gallery. I hope that answers your question. I would like to add something. Um, personally, I think, um, you know, the, the line drawn between art museums and other museums is an artificial and constructed line. It does not exist into, into the heads of the majority of the public. They, they go there because they have a certain interest. And the needs with which they come to an art museum are not very much different from the needs they have visiting any other um, similar institution, be it a museum for natural history or for cultural history or for whatever. Schnapps glasses. We have a Schnapps glass museum here around the corner. So um, people come there with their needs, and that is the point. If I think about the, the best um, art exhibitions I've seen, um, it were those who communicated a lot. It were those who explained to me, who gave me a chance to get a new view onto what I was seeing beyond the only aesthetic approach. And then I say uh, the methodology that Lisa's proposing is absolutely valuable for them. Yeah, so I, I definitely hear that it's, of course, coming back to visitor choice. There's always going to be choice before you enter. And then if we can, you know, only build on that inside the museum that only getting better. Um, so for the next question here, uh, we're, we're wondering how can we convince um, a very large organization that doesn't do so much to engage the public um, and create a network within the city? How, how can we in, um, encourage them to start this process? Did it work with us, Jan? How did I encourage you to? <laughs> um, yeah, well, the, the first thing is you, you have to get a leap into the organization at a level that can influence decisions. In our case, that was me. Um, as head of department, I report to the director and I, if I say to the director, this is valuable, um, the chances are good that the director will react. So I think having an allied agent in the, in the museum itself who is close to decision taking, that is, that is the, the, the reason for Lisa being successful with us. And you have to remember, everybody, that Jan was really quite grumpy with me when I first arrived and asking me really difficult questions like, what am I getting? What are the tangibles? What are the outcomes? And I had to say, trust me, place your faith in the process. And he did. So thank you for that, Jan. Otherwise, none of this would have happened. I, I believe thank you, of course. Thank you for that to 200 people. <laughs> 
Now, I, I believe you, of course, but I, I do have to say it is, uh, it is a leap of faith because you do, uh, the, both of you make such a great team here. So I'm, I'm glad that that transition happened. Um, and the other thing also is to start with a small project. We just started with the multimedia guide. You need proof of concept, especially when it's new processes. So don't, I mean, it's taken us two years to a point where we're going to be working together strategically on the whole music, the holistic museum experience. But just start with one thing, yeah, one thing, prove it, and then scale up. That's probably the best way to start. Yeah. Excellent. So starting small, scaling up, and keeping the holistic methodology in mind. It's wonderful. Um, so we have a question for you both here. Uh, what do you think about virtual online tours as a way to develop your audience? And I would add to that, do you think this, uh, like to which extent can you include the, the experience design in the online realm? Oh, completely. I mean, I've, I've done it in the past. It's, it's exactly the same principle, just a different medium. Um, in terms of trying to get people to come to a museum, um, I would say don't uh, pull your punctures. So if you're going to do a virtual um, exhibition, use this as an opportunity to show your personality, not just what you've got. And try and create at that first point an emotional bond, whether it's through humour or a sense of identity in place or whatever it is, so that people are drawn to you and then they want to experience how you do what you do, not just what you have in your galleries. Yeah? Um, the question is, can you adapt it to the digital realm? The answer is yes, you can. Um, the, the, the thing is that the digital experience is different from the real experience, but that everybody knows. Um, we started the process with a digital project and we learned so much through that way about what we have to do because the digital is just bridging your way into the museum. You know, it's just, it's just the, the long call into the wild, um, getting people inside. So you start to make a promise there and if you do it in the digital, you, you do a good job if you do not stop in the digital. Great. Um, so, I mean, we have a lot of questions here, but um, I think I'm going to choose this one as a wrap up. Um, and that is, what are, uh, it's specifically for Lisa, but Jan, of course, you're welcome. Um, it's uh, what are some of the main challenges that you're seeing from museums uh, in order to in order to manage or embrace this kind of thinking? Like, are, are there some challenges that you're seeing repeated over and over again? Yeah, um, and this is quite a personal one. Sorry, everybody, but uh, I'm not a museologist. I don't have a degree in museum studies. And it's really interesting. I I'm a specialist in experience and experience design. Um, and I find uh, trying to get a foot in the door is actually very hard and who to speak to. Um, uh, and so on the bell curve of innovation, I spent my time looking for the innovators and early adopters, the people who are ready to try something new. Um, and if they don't have that mindset in the first instance, um, it's going to be very hard to get a foot in the door. So it's always about trying to find those people who want to try something new. It's also quite a difficult thing to explain. As Ian said, it's when you experience it. All my programs are designed to elicit moments of insight. It's all about experiential change, uh, experiential learning. Culture change comes from within. So even though this is all about the visitor, the soft outcome is that I'm working on the team so that they get it. Because if they don't get it, it's just another shiny new tool rather than something that they actually believe in. Yeah, so in order to, as, as you said earlier, implement holistically, it's really that first, uh, you know, dipping your toe in that willing to, willingness to be vulnerable and try something new, which Precisely. of course can, can be difficult, but uh, certainly rewarding if we're brave, en brave enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, with that, um, I will thank you both uh, once again. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a really a wonderful webinar, very insightful. Um, Paul learned quite a bit. Um, and yes, I uh, am ending here and uh, welcoming everyone, of course, to uh, tomorrow's session, uh, our, our next session, which you'll find here.
Um, you can join us. We will be starting as usual on time at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, we always recommend you come in a little bit early. Um, and our session that we will be getting with is how to create a new type of museum. So uh, just as we are finishing up here, we're going to continue with some more great discussions tomorrow. We're looking forward to your participation. And following that, uh, we will have a bit of a wrap up uh, with uh, David from Nemo. And uh, from there, we're just going to discuss a bit of what we've learned in the past three sessions and where we go from here. And lastly, of course, uh, we do have another special treat of an online museum tour in Rijeka, where of course, naturally we all wish we could be, but we're all very happy to be here online together. So if you have not uh, registered for these events tomorrow, you will find the registration link in the chat. And yeah, feel free to join us. We look forward to seeing you then. Bye now.